Hi everybody. Um, so we have reached a point in Roman history where we can start to talk about the empire, um, and uh, you know this this transition period from republic to empire was quite long. Uh, it comprised the subject matter of uh, the, the last week of the course, um, and uh, many of you may have been I don't know overwhelmed by the amount of uh, material, the the numbers of people involved in this, and and. Uh, uh, my apologies for that. This, but you know, that is Roman history. Okay. Um, this week will slow down a bit, uh, and we're going to talk primarily this week about the reign of Augustus Caesar, um, or Octavian, as he was known previously, and as we have known him up to this point. Um, and uh, you know, this as well as his successors uh, for the first couple of dynasties of the Roman Empire. One of the things that we need to consider here. Um, that will brood over uh, a lot of the discussion this week is why did Octavian succeed in completing this transformation to autocracy? Uh, where Julius Caesar, um, for instance, or Sulla or others uh, who had tried to transform the, the Republic um, uh, failed in the long run, um, either due to retirement and exhaustion in Sulla's case, or, uh, of course, assassination in Julius Caesar's case, why was Octavian able to stick this out? Um, and, you know, I'm going to try to give a few key points uh, to help us answer that question. Um, a little bit of terminology here. Uh, the political system of the empire, um, from the reign of Octavian through the reign of Diocletian, so this is about three centuries, from 31 BCE to 285 CE. Um, this period of Roman history, the political system is known as the Principate. And that is after the word princeps, um, which uh, I will explain a bit later. This is a, a key title of the so-called emperor. Uh, he was not necessarily called emperor, at least not uh, during the time of Augustus. Uh, that, that term would come somewhat later. Um, rather, Augustus preferred to be called princeps, or rather to go uh, sort of publicly with the title of princeps. Um, and, and I'll try to help you understand why that's the case. So we want to talk about why Octavian succeeded. After Actium, as we mentioned last time, um, he uh, claimed Egypt, um, but he didn't, unlike earlier conquerors um, like Pompey or Caesar or uh, others who had, had come before him, did not then turn it over to Rome to become public land. Instead, Octavian claimed Egypt as his own personal possession. He, claimed, he said that he had conquered it and he would administer it directly. And of all of the things that Octavian did, of all of the shrewd political maneuvers that he pulled off, and there were many of them, this may have been the most important. You might be wondering why. Okay, well, um, Egypt was the wealthiest and most productive region of the entire Mediterranean. And so Octavian then controls it directly, which means he can tax and demand tribute from, and otherwise extract wealth from, the most productive, wealthiest region of the Roman Empire. And he doesn't have to answer to anybody else. Okay? Um, a, an analogy that I like to use in this case is, let's say, heaven forbid, that uh, an autocrat managed to get control of the United States of America and was working with, a, a, you know, a kind of body of governors similar to, say, the Roman Senate or something like that. Um, but the ruler, the autocrat, said, well, I'll turn all of the rest of the land of the United States over to, uh, you know, to this other body, um, or I'll work together with them to administer that. But I'm going to keep California for myself. Okay, now why is this a good analogy? Well, California has the largest population of any state in the country. Um, it has by far the largest economy. Um, and, uh, you know, the ability to tax a place like that directly um, would allow that individual to achieve a fortune that would be unrivaled. For all of the control of lands and wealth and the political process that patricians had, um, they, no one in Roman history 
could rival Octavian in the amount of wealth that he accumulated in his life. Now, why is that important? Well, we've already noted that Rome was a democracy. That is, it was ruled by the wealthy. If, if uh, Roman uh, politicians wanted to get things done, uh, the most efficient thing to do was to use their own money. Well, Octavian was able to do this at a level that no one else had ever dreamed of because he controlled Egypt, and, I mean, this was just his cash cow, right? Uh, the thing that gave him um, one of the largest personal fortunes, maybe the very largest personal fortune in the history of the world, okay? Um, and so no one could rival Octavian for the rest of his life, uh, try as they might, right, to do impressive things and win honor and all of that, uh, all of their efforts would have paled in comparison to what Octavian was able to do. And, and uh, if he then has the greatest amount of wealth and, and does the greatest number of things to win honor and prestige and reputation uh, in an unprecedented fashion, well, eventually they're going to get to the point where they just look to Octavian to solve all of the problems. And that's kind of what happened. Um, he remained consul uh, for nine years, um, from 31 BCE to 23 BCE. Um, he celebrated a consulship every single year, and he did several things during this period that were important. Uh, one that we might note is that um, after the Battle of Actium, Octavian decided quite shrewdly that... Um, Having such a large number of soldiers at arms was not a good thing, um, and uh, that you know he needed a smaller, more manageable army um, if he was going to remain in control of it, um, because otherwise, you know, some rival politician might, uh, as many Romans had done, uh, kind of rise up uh, in a position of power and um, you know obtain a client army and then go to war with Octavian, and we'd have another round of civil war. Well, he wanted to head that off. And so, in one of his early consulships, um, he arranged for the settlement of somewhere around 100,000, maybe more, um, soldiers who had fought in these civil wars. And he gave them lands, um, uh, he gave them money, pensions, um, and this is exactly what these military veterans had wanted. Um, this is by far the largest number of these veterans who had ever been given such things, right? And they remained loyal, it seems, at least most of them, for the rest of their lives to Octavian because he, the, he had provided for a huge number of them what they, what they were always seeking in the first place. And this trimmed down the size of the army and allowed uh, Octavian to keep his finger on it while it also remained uh, an effective fighting force. Um, in the year 28, Octavian and his right-hand man Agrippa were consuls, um, and they also had the power of the censor, um, which we've talked about involved in large part uh, taking a census. There hadn't been a census taken in about 40 years due to all the civil wars. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about how Sulla and especially Julius Caesar had tried to remake the Senate by stocking it with their own supporters. Um, well, Augustus, and, and the, everything he did, he tried to present as a restoration of traditional things. Um, and he succeeded in large part in convincing people that he was trying to return Rome to a republic. And so he and Agrippa, with the power of the censor, uh, conducted a census, and um, they ended up purging from the senatorial roles several hundred senators. They actually convinced quite a number of them that they were simply not worthy. They didn't have enough wealth or honor or anything to be on the Senate. And some of these men voluntarily retired, and they were given rewards to do that. And then with, with uh, several dozen more, maybe 150 or so more, um, uh, Octavian forcibly, not forcibly like by arms, but uh, he expelled them from the rolls and publicly shamed them, although all of these men were able to keep certain perks of that office. He trimmed down the Senate to about 600 members from the roughly 900 it had been during the time of Julius Caesar. Um, and uh, these were wealthy, honorable men um, 
uh, and many of them recognize that honor and power uh, now all revolved around Augustus um, or Octavian. I'm not going to call him Augustus yet. We need to get to that point. Okay. Um, in fact, this is, this is an important point, actually, because we've talked about how vital honor was to the cultural and social conceptions of Rome. Um, Octavian transformed honor from something that was obtained by either inheritance or doing great deeds in high positions in the Roman government, right? Um, well, Octavian made it so that no one else was able to rival doing great things um, because he could do it bigger and better than anybody else had ever dreamed of, as we've said. Um, and so instead, honor came to be uh, associated with personal connection to Augustus himself, or to Octavian himself. That a man who was close to the princeps, close to Octavian, would have greater honor than, than someone else. Uh, a man who was recognized personally for his achievements, not by the Senate or by the Roman people, but by Octavian, gained honor to an extent that, that you know, working through uh, another system to gain honor uh, did not um, achieve, right? And so honor starts to revolve around the emperor. In the year 27, um, Octavian, and this was all staged, there's no doubt about it, okay? Um, probably prearranged, people were speaking on cue and all of that. But in a meeting of the Senate, uh, Octavian said... Look, I've been consul for too long. This is all unprecedented. We've got to get back to doing things the way the Republic worked in the first place. And, you know, go back to the old system. And so he said, I am retiring from the consulship. And on cue, uh, people in the audience started to shout and say, No, you can't do this. We need you, Rome. Uh, it is your duty to Rome to continue to serve no one can do it as effectively as you can. Your job's not done. Uh, I don't know what else they shouted uh, or you know any of that, right? Um, and Octavian, probably sighing deeply, said, Oh, very well, if it's the will of the people that I continue to serve as consul, I will do that. And so he got credit for restoring the Republic without having to give up any of the, his power as consul. Um, this was a cleverly staged moment uh, that succeeded wildly, right? In addition to being consul, um, in fact, as sort of part of that stage thing, the Senate turned over control of the army to Octavian. And in fact, this would uh, be reiterated or reinforced several times through his reign. Um, and this was in large part because Octavian was given direct governorship or direct administration over most of the frontier provinces. Now, um, I'm going to go to a map here. I'll come back to this at the points in a second. But um, uh, this is from a slightly later period. Uh, you might note, for instance, that um, you know we have legions stationed up here in the British Isles. Uh, Rome, at this point in the reign of Octavian, did not control uh, any of the British Isles. Um, this was not yet a province. That would happen under uh, the Emperor Claudius uh, a few decades after the reign of Augustus, right? So, um, but this still gives you a sense of where the late the legions of Rome were stationed. They're all along the Rhine River, which is here, the Danube River, with some, you know, more in the interior here in Illyria or here in. Um, uh, kind of Thrace uh, region, okay, and then a lot here on the eastern frontier, uh, the border with the Parthian Empire, um, and a couple down here in Egypt, and a couple of others, right? Well, Octavian was given governorship over all of the territories where most of the army was placed, which allowed him to control the army directly, and to call all of the shots militarily. And so his fabulous wealth that came in large part because of his control in, uh, of Egypt, although he had lots of other lands and lots of other ways to get money, despite, you know, apart from that. Um, and uh, his control of the army. These are, these are two important keys 
to his wielding of power. In addition to being consul for all of those years, Augustus or Octavian, I'm still, I keep jumping the gun here, uh, Octavian um, was also uh, given the title of Princeps Senatus. And now, this is where the word, this is where we get the word uh, principate, right? Um, traditionally, in the Republic, the Princeps Senatus was like the chairman of the Senate. Um, if you think about, you know, a, a meeting of somebody that uh, operates by Robert's Rules of Order or something like that, right? You always have this chairperson um, who holds a gavel and calls people to order and, uh, you know, conducts business and things like that. Well, ancient Rome didn't necessarily use Robert's Rules of Order, but they probably had their own kind of set of rules about how to conduct business. But this title meant in practice that Octavian was able to um, determine the agenda of the Senate and to speak first and whenever he wanted in meetings of the Senate. He could even interrupt other senators at his own whim or his own will. Um, Any time, right, he could speak and whoever uh, was currently speaking would have to yield the floor. And so this gave him a lot of administrative control over the Senate. But beyond that... Uh, Octavian took this title, which really was this kind of honorific, often given to an old, venerable senator who'd been around for a really long time and knew how things operated and can conduct business efficiently. Um, He took that title and made it into something different. This is the title that he used to present himself to the Roman public. He would say, I am the princeps. Now, this also has the connotation of being first. First in the Senate, certainly, but Augustus or Octavian extended that out to say, I am the first of Rome. And this didn't mean that he was dominant over everybody else, that he was a king or an autocrat or something, at least that's not how he's trying to portray himself. This meant something like first among equals or first citizen. We're all citizens, I'm just the first among us, uh, the one who is able to do the most good, right? And it worked. This is a non-threatening title that allows him to portray himself as, sorry, as indispensable for the Roman political system, for the Roman government. Um, And later emperors uh, would continue to use this title that way. That's why we call this whole period the Principate. In the year um, 23, there was it seems, an assassination plot. Um, It didn't succeed. It was discovered. Um, Actually, it was an associate of Mycenaeus, who, as we've said, was one of Augustus, or one of Octavian's chief advisors. Um, This is the guy who would, you know, bring him artists and uh, poets and and sort of created this whole uh, literary orbit around uh, Octavian, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, where Figures like uh, Horace and Virgil and others, um, you know, started to to work for the emperor. Um, well, Mycenaeus wasn't involved in the plot necessarily, but it did, you know, the scandal of it did draw him in, and, and uh, he ended up retiring into private life, kind of withdrawing from the court of Augustus. Um, and Octavian realized at that point that continuing to hold the position of consul was probably too threatening to the conservative elements within Roman society who were desperate to get back to the old republic, that he had not somehow, through his propaganda and all of his big shows about restoring the republic, had not convinced them that he was, in in fact, doing anything but autocracy. Um, and so, at the end of that year, he announced that he was not going to stand for election as consul again. And this drew public outcry, and even the Senate, recognizing that they would need to do something to reward him for this, uh, again, this, a lot of this is probably carefully staged, they gave him two positions that would allow him to continue to hold the same amount of power as the consul, in fact, to some extent, even greater power than the position of consul. For one, they named him proconsul, and which meant that he held imperium, 
and they gave him authority over most of the lands outside of Italy. Again, as we talked about, he controlled all of the lands that had large numbers of soldiers in them, right? And so Proconsular Imperium was part of this. And then they also awarded him the office of Tribune. And in fact, they, they declared that he would be Tribune for life. Um, now, what does that give him? Well, it, first of all, it, it gives him control over the whole legislative process. He can um, propose legislation in the Concilium Plebis. He can exercise a veto over any other uh, member of the Roman government trying to do something. Um, it, it gives him a veto power over the reigning consuls. Um, and so it's... Um, now, even though you know the Concilium Plebis was starting to become a kind of defunct institution... Um, it, you know, he's still, as, as Tribune, he claimed to represent the people. As proconsul, he really was uh, firmly in this tradition of ruling as a patrician, right? And so he, he's able to bridge the gap by holding these two positions. And he held those for the rest of his life. Um, in the year 22, Rome, uh, and this is sort of timely because Octavian retires from his position as... Um, uh, consul, and immediately Rome faces a crisis. Uh, there was a massive food shortage, um, and uh, the Senate and people came to him, actually separately on a couple different occasions, and offered him the position of dictator. In fact, they, they said, you've got to become dictator. We need someone like you. In fact, you, uh, you're the only one who can do this, uh, to get us through this crisis. Um, and Octavian, recognizing the opportunity here, first of all, turned down the office of dictator. He said, I don't need that. Um, you know, this is out of sorts with uh, uh, the way that we've functioned in the Republic. Um, what he recognized here was if he took up the position of dictator, this would give his enemies ammunition to say that he was continuing this trend toward autocracy. Instead, he said, look, I'll take care of the food shortage. And with his own money... He quickly ordered grain uh, to be expedited, so to speak. Um, it's not like Amazon Prime was delivering or something like that. But you know, somehow within a few days, he was able to obtain enough food to mitigate uh, the food shortage and to return uh, the city of Rome to normal, all without assuming the dictatorship. And this gave him a great deal of power, right? Uh, sorry for the yawn. A great deal of honor. Um, and so, how did this work? Um, well, in meetings of the Senate, uh, Octavian, as princeps senatus and as proconsul with imperium, would sit in the most elevated, uh, most prominent place. The consuls would flank him on either side, but it was clear to everybody who was really making the decisions. And he turned a lot of business over to the Senate, but it tended to be, I mean, because he's able to, to set the agenda, um, you know, he would uh, give the Senate tasks to do, things to talk about, things to debate. But most of these um, had very little to do with actual wielding of power. He was doing all of that himself. He was making unilateral decisions as with proconsular imperium and as tribune. In the year uh, 13 BCE, um, Lepidus, one of the old members of the Second Triumvirate, um, who was still around, died, and thus the position of Pontifex Maximus was vacated. Well, of course, who took up that position but Octavian? Um, and so now he was the chief priest of the Roman religious cults. Um, and beyond that... He was given an honorific, and, and this was not unprecedented, but what he made of it was unprecedented. Um, he was awarded by the Senate and the Roman people the title of Augustus. Now, this just meant something like a revered one, um, but Augustus pushed that farther um, to start to create a cult around the person of the emperor. And earlier Roman... Um, uh, prominent figures like Julius Caesar, for instance, had been deified, but that happened after their death. They had been proclaimed to God, shrines were set up to them, offerings were given to them, priests were, you know, ordered to perform rituals at their tombs or at their shrines. Um, 
you know, and this is more akin to like ancestor worship than the worship of, say, Jupiter or um, uh, or Juno or a uh, god like that, right? But some Augustus pushed this further than it ever had been. First of all, he was deified during his life, um, and this ruler cult began to emerge. Now, this didn't um, have the same effect everywhere in the empire. Um, in the east, where they were accustomed, especially in places like Egypt, where they were accustomed to being ruled by god kings. This was pushed to a much greater extent than... I mean, they, they, did, they literally did see him as a god on Earth. Um, in Rome, uh, that didn't happen so much. There were shrines and there were, like, temples and things like that, or, or you know, small uh, worship centers built, um, revolving around the genius of the emperor, meaning his creative spirit, um, which was thought to, you know, be connected to the gods themselves, right? Um, and so... The ruler cult, cult begins to emerge, and this is going to grow in popularity over time. Uh, it begins with Augustus Caesar, the, the cult of the living emperor, right? And so he becomes this the, the most important religious figure in all of Rome. And so what we have here is a kind of constellation, or a you know a, an orbit uh, uh, of these um, various positions. Uh, and titles that revolve around Octavian himself, or I'm going to start calling him Augustus for good now, uh, that revolve around Augustus. Um, tribune, proconsul, control of the army, provincial governor, uh, direct, you know, direct ruler of Egypt, um, the ruler cult, the, the title of Augustus, the princeps senatus, right? All of these things equal emperor. Though, again, that title isn't really created at this point. As far as his day-to-day -day running of the Roman government... Oh, and by the way, Augustus never became consul again... Uh, well, I shouldn't say never. He, he didn't become consul again for a couple of decades, and it was only when his grandsons, uh, whom he adopted as his direct sons, by the way... Um, uh, were starting to come of age and uh, needed to be introduced into public life. At that point, Augustus allowed himself to stand election for consul so that he could rule alongside his grandsons and prepare them to take up rule after him. Um, unfortunately, as we'll talk about later, uh, his, these grandsons ended up dying quite young, um, and Augustus outlived them. Um... But as far as government went, he, uh, while he, you know, worked effectively with the Senate, convinced them that they still held some amount of power, that he was their partner uh, in all of that, um, when it came to actually getting things done, uh, Augustus, ironically, given that he's moving toward autocracy, um, introduced a f far greater measure of meritocracy into the actual functioning of government. He gave people jobs who were capable of doing this, not because they came from some prestigious family. And for the most part, he's drawing from the equites, right? He sets up the equestrians, in fact, as an almost rival group to the senators, um, uh, though with separate jobs. Um, and, you know, we've already seen that to some extent, but, but he's pushing this even more. Uh, he, you know, catered to the interests of the equites to keep the senators off balance, and catered to the interests of the senators to keep the equites off balance, right? So he's dividing and conquering among all of these groups who wield power. Um, and the most capable individuals were given the pride of place. And it's understandable why Augustus would do this. I mean, he came from rural Italy. Uh, he did not achieve senatorial rank until after uh, his, after Julius Caesar's death and after you know his inheritance was acknowledged. It was only at that point that he really became a patrician. Um, and, you know, that that early upbringing had a real influence on this guy. Um, and he recognized merit when he saw it, probably saw something of himself in many of these equites and others uh, to whom he gave positions and, and uh, gave responsibilities. Um, Augustus did, we might say, fail... Um, uh, we might even, we might also say had less success, um, perhaps, with some projects that he tried to undertake. Um, for one, uh, he never quite, well, he never really at all was able to achieve anything militarily after the Battle of Actium. Uh, if you look at 
the empire that Augustus controlled. Um, his chief military accomplishment was the conquest of Egypt, and this was almost by default after he beat uh, Antony and Cleopatra. There was no one left in Egypt to, you know, to rival that kind of power, and he easily just claimed it. Um, but he stabilized the border with Parthia. He, he didn't you know, try to do what Ca Crassus had done before him and take an army over here and try to conquer. Um, he did send legions across the Rhine River in an attempt to extend the borders of Roman territory to the Elba River. That's this river right here. Okay. And this did not succeed. Um, the three legions who were sent into the region that the, the Romans called Germania, this is where we get the word Germany, by the way, um, uh, were wiped out um, by a Germanic chieftain um, who had a very effective fighting force, and these legions were kind of ambushed and, and uh, completely destroyed. And Augustus realized that um, he you know, didn't have the uh, resources and, you know, uh, really the, uh, we might even say the will um, to continue to try to expand Roman territory. He was far more caught up with securing his position in Rome itself, though there are, you know, rumors in the sources and things that uh, he was haunted by this the rest of his life. He would wake up in the night screaming uh, for his lost legions and, and these sorts of things. It's probably all just... Um, uh, additional mythological material that's added somewhat later. Um, but yeah, uh, Rome starts to have pretty defined borders as an empire. The Rhine River here, the Danube River, and this, you know, this line with Parthia. And this is going to move back and forth, as we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, it's pretty secure at this point. Um, and so less success militarily after the Civil Wars. Um, one we'll talk about later on is that he tried uh, to impose upon the Roman people um, what we might call moral legislation, um, ordering, you know, the, the sorts of uh, laws and decrees that encourage people to uh, have lots of children, to um, have stable marriages, you know, he encouraged monogamy and things like this, kind of ironic from a guy who effectively stole the wife of another guy, um, but, you know... Uh, Hypocrisy is not something that the Romans worried about a great deal, um, but we'll we'll discuss that later. That that one didn't succeed either. One place where he did succeed wildly was in his patronage of the arts. Um, it's during the reign of Augustus that we have what we what scholars have called the golden age of um, of Latin literature, and I want to devote a little time in a another lecture to talking about Virgil and Ovid and Horace um, and uh, some of the other leading lights in this period. Uh, they are important. Um, uh, these are great works of, uh, of world and Western literature, and so we need to at least be conversant in, in what they had to say, and also in the influence that Augustus had on them. But that's a topic for another time. And then finally, to win great popularity, as others had done before him, um, Octavian or Augustus uh, staged all sorts of entertainments, um, and we'll discuss those when we look at the uh, the document called the Deeds of the Deified Augustus. But he also built a lot of things. Um, new aqueducts, new cisterns, new roads, new bridges, new sewage systems, new temples, new um, uh, entertainment facilities, right? Um, uh, dozens of major structures were built during his reign in Rome. He transformed the city um, in ways that uh, made it far more amenable to the large and growing population, um, but also provided jobs to the working class people uh, who lived in Rome, um, and thus endeared them to Augustus, or rather endeared uh, him to them, um, and uh, he was incredibly popular among the masses, though maybe not so much among the more conservative senators who would have preferred a return to the traditional system, or who probably resented you know, his stranglehold on power. All right, so I think that that, you know, clarifies most of what I wanted to say about Augustus 